Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today on Lagos Live. Um, we have a really interesting conversation coming up, but as we get started, I would just love to hear from everyone who's tuning in. Where are you tuning in from? How long have you used Lagos? What's your favorite IVP book? If you have an, a favorite IVP book, I would love to see those in the comments. So drop anything you got. As we get started, um, I would love to introduce our guest, but to set the stage a little bit for where we're going, it's helpful to think about maybe how much of the evangelical landscape has been shaped by Christian publishing. Um, and so today we're talking with John Boyd and Al Shee of IVP, and they're going to be sharing a little bit more about the work that they do and the Christian publishing world as a whole. Um, and as we get started, I would just love to give a little shout out to our friends at IVP. Um, this month is, I believe it's this month, maybe it was last month, but is the 75th anniversary of IVP's existence. And so that's just a huge testament to their longevity. And um, it's pretty cool. So on behalf of Lagos, congrats, you guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we're talking about where the Christian publishing world has been, where it's going, how it's contributed to this larger conversation. And so whether you like to read books, write content, listen to thought-provoking speakers, you'll want to stick around. Um, and so as we get started, I'll introduce our guest. We've got John Boyd with us. Um, he's an associate publisher and academic editorial director at InterVarsity Press, where he's worked since 2012, so 10 years. That's awesome. Um, he holds a PhD in history from Johns Hopkins, an MA in Old Testament from TEDS, and a BA in history from the University of Michigan. A few degrees there. Um, Got to keep them stacking, right? Um, <laughs> he previously worked on uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, North Park University, and on the campus ministry side of InterVarsity. So that's InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Um, he's also contributed to the Encyclopedia of, of Chicago, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, and his writing has also appeared in Fides at Historia, the Common Review, Baseball Research Journal, and Current, among other places. He's also a saxophonist in an improv rock band, which sounds like so much fun, um, a devotee of uh, manual typewriters, and with his spouse and daughters is a resident in Chicago. So, John, thanks for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Awesome. And then Al Shi is also with us. He's a senior editor at IVP, where he acquires and develops books in areas such as culture, church and ministry, uh, discipleship, and global mission. In two decades, over two decades at IVP, he's worked with over 275 authors and published more than 400 books. So just a couple. Um, seen a few things. Um, and it, those include titles uh, by Michael Card, Andy Crouch, Makoto Fujimura, um, and Sandra, Sandra Van Opstel. Um, he's also published books in partnerships with organizations such as the Billy Graham Center, International Justice Mission, Operation World, the Urbana Student Minis uh, Missions Conference, the Veritas Forum, and World Relief. Um, he holds a PhD from TEDS as well as a master's from uh, Wheaton College Graduate School and has been a columnist for Christianity Today. He's also written three books, um, Grieving a Suicide, The Suburban Christian, and Singles at the Crossroads. And most relevant to our conversation today, he compiled and wrote material for the expanded edition of Ivy Peace History, which is a book called Heart, Soul, Mind, Strength. Um, that actually is coming out on August 2nd, I believe. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Um, and so that is, it, it's coming out in, um, on, a, on the occasion of IVP 75th anniversary. And I'm partially part of the way through it. It's been really fascinating. And so I would encourage anyone to pick that up. Um, and he and his wife and two sons live in Chicago as well. So thanks for joining us, Al. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, as we get started, would would you guys be able to kind of explain IVP for anyone who may not be familiar with um, University Press and that that publishing sort of side of things? Yeah, I'll let it. I'll get started with that one. That's one it's right okay. down Main Street for him. Yeah, well, University Press grows out of the ministry of University Christian Fellowship, the campus ministry, which started in the UK. So uh, it, back in the 1930s and 40s, it started at Cambridge and Oxford. It was their Christian ministries that were working intercollegiately, uh, Cambridge and Oxford. 
And they eventually migrated and planted university in the United States, well, Canada first, and then the United States uh, in the 40s. And even before IVP was officially um, uh, found in the US, we distributed books from the UK, so from IVP UK, and distributed British authors, uh, British evangelicals, and provided resources. But pretty soon we felt the need in the, to to have some homegrown resources. So several of our staff started writing Bible study guides and curriculum and other other books in the early 40s. 1943 was the first one, uh, uh, Discovering the Gospel of Mark by by uh, Jane Hollingsworth. And she was a Wheaton grad and a seminary degree. Um, she, her seminary degree was from Biblical Seminary, I think, in New York. So from the very start, uh, things like women in ministry and Bible study, uh, which have been hallmarks of, of uh, university ministry and publishing over the decades. So, and then in 1947 is when we officially were incorporated. So that's why we have the 75th birthday for for then. Um, but that the, the actual date, exact date, is lost to history. But so we counted at the beginning of the fiscal year. Yeah, we're basically saying July. Yeah, just because better than nothing else. Yeah, the, I'll let me add the 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 big part of the DNA of that story that Al. Um, has told is our roots in the university ministries of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And um, the IVCF is active uh, on, on hundreds of campuses with hundreds of fellowships all around um, the United States now. And as is the case on university campuses, there's a wide range of uh, academic disciplines, academic fields represented there. So that's really been baked into IVP from the beginning. Yes, biblical studies at the at the heart of things. Yes, um, you know, church related uh, theology, but um, a really broad range too, from business to the sciences, to nursing, to um, politics and current affairs. Um, we've got a little bit of that flavor of the university world because, because of our um, historic connection with with uh, University Christian Fellowship. These days, almost all of our publishing is for a wider audience. It's, it's really not just publishing just for the student groups, although we love it when they work there too, but uh, um, it's it's uh, the university world is kind of near the heart of our history and the heart of our current passions too. And another thing that comes from the history and the DNA is that we inherited some of the sensibilities of British evangelicalism. And so British evangelicalism never went through a modernist fundamentalist split like it did in the U.S. And so British evangelicalism tended to not be anti-intellectual, tended to not be fundamentalist. And that has been characteristic of our kind of publishing. We, we are not anti-intellectual. We're not anti-university. We are all about engaging ideas uh, and the, in the public square. And so that, that has been our approach, I think, our, our posture toward thinking through things. Right. Yeah, it's been much more a Christ transforming culture than a Christ against culture kind of model um, in that way. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And it kind of highlights a little bit of how IVP maybe stands in its own camp as far as the publishing world goes. Um, are there other factors that you would say that like maybe the mission and vision of IVP um, that tends to set IVP apart in some ways? Oh, that's so hard for us to say. We think so. I mean, we like working at IVP, um, but actually every publisher is doing their own thing. And I think almost, you know, 99% of the time we're, we're, it's really a, a team of, of public, uh, you know, in the whole publishing universe um, working together. But yeah, we certainly don't want to neglect parts of the publishing work that we can do well. Um, and that includes having a mix of books that reach general readers, um, people in the pew, you know, maybe even new Christians, maybe people who don't read many books a year at all. Um, but can, we, you know, we love publishing for those folks, as well as then technical monographs in academic specialties that, um, you know, that we can, we know it's a smaller audience, but it's a high leverage audience. That'll be a book maybe that changes a researcher's mind who writes their own book differently who then professors assign and you know generations of students might be influenced so we love doing we, we love publishing across that whole spectrum and that's something we've been able to do um yeah we function like an academic press with a lot of our academic books and reference works um but we also have a, a really broad uh general readership as well 
We can also mention that every Christian publisher has its own DNA and history. The, the, there's three general categories for Christian publishing. There are the family-owned publishers. So Erdman's is owned by the Erdman's family, uh, Baker by the Baker family, Tyndale by the Taylor family and others. Uh, then there's ministry-owned uh, publishers like IVP is owned by University Christian Fellowship. Uh, Moody is owned by Moody Bible Institute. Uh, and then there's corporate-owned publishers like Zondervan, which is owned by HarperCollins, which is owned by uh, News Corp, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> and so each of these have their own different uh, histories and missional purposes. Um, and so with, with family-owned uh, publishers, it may have been the denominational background, and, and denomination is another category that falls under ministry. It may have been the particular uh, interests of the founders or the early uh, editors uh, with a mission organizations uh, based publishing there, there's often a connection to the ministry so for us it's the university world and so we have always had a posture of not just rescuing people from the university uh, but but redeeming the university we, we're not interested in you know taking fish out of the pond but but seeing that the, fo the whole pond flourishes and so on um, and then with with corporate owned, we have good friends at other publishing houses that, that are able to do good Christian publishing work at, at, but we do hear horror stories of how it's all about the bottom line and they have to sell millions of copies to make it work for their stakeholders. So, yeah, one another implication for our publishing philosophy f from um, that history for us is that because the university is a place where a broad range of ideas are entertained and discussed. That's really um, historically how we have published. We don't publish from a single denominational point of view, for instance. There's not one um, relatively narrow creedal statement, although we publish on the creeds. We're, we're very likely actually to publish two authors on the same issue who violently disagree with each other. I sometimes fantasize about having dinner with two people who I really don't think would like having dinner together, but we publish them. And that's not an accident. It's not like a mistake. We, we like, we missed, we missed that. Um, you know, if someone's, if someone thinks we're too liberal, the next person's going to think we're too conservative on a particular issue, for instance. And, and that's because of where we're coming from, we're trying to publish the best contributions to important conversations. Um, and there's a, there's a, although we have a Christian, statement of faith uh, that orients us, there's still, of course, a wide range of uh, discourse that's possible within um, within those many of those issues, whether it's politics or scientific issues or biblical studies, you know, authorship of gospels, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and back in the 1970s, IVP actually invented the Four Views book. So uh, we did a number of books on four views on the millennium or four views on women in ministry or four views on baptism or, or other topical issues um, where the, each of the contributors writes their own chapter and then the others write their response and they have an ironic dialogue and let the reader decide uh, and you know what which perspective is most persuasive. Um, J.A. Packer once said about IVP, he said, some publishers tell you what let me, let me get this quote right. Some publishers tell you what to believe. Others tell you what you you already believe. But InterVarsity Press helps you to believe. And publishing broadly, publishing four views books that is one expression of that. We, we trust our readers to make their own decision uh, given the, what they are able to read. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that kind of pulls out in different ways something that Al and John, you both have mentioned, um, which is this not necessarily feeling against culture, um, but trying to say something meaningful within the culture. And so there was a quote from Heart, Soul, Mind, and Strength that I noticed that um, InterVarsity did not primarily see itself as an adversary of culture, but as a reforming participant of culture. Um, and that kind of just pulls together exactly what you both were saying about um, publishing widely, publishing within this broad Christian sphere. Um, and so I would be curious to hear your perspectives on how publishing broadly in that way, particularly in the evangelical world, shapes the culture a little bit and advances conversations. Well, one of the best statements on that 
uh, some years ago was Andy Crouch's book, Culture Making. And he did this great taxonomy typology of how different eras of Christians have, have approached culture differently. Back in the fundamentalist era, era uh, Christians condemned culture. Uh, back in the 60s with thinkers like Francis Schaeffer and Labrie, uh, Christians critiqued culture. Back in the 80s and 90s, uh, Christians often uh, copied culture and and would make their own Christian versions of music or whatever. And but most of the time we tend to just consume culture. <laughs> but Andy Crouch says that the only way you can change culture is to create culture, to make more of it. Uh, and so publishing, one of the things I love about our work is that we are creating, we are making artifacts to these books or ebooks or audiobooks that we have that that contribute to a conversation that people can reckon with and and uh, set, often we don't our books uh, don't necessarily tell people what to think but they tell people what to think about and here's input and here's ideas and research and ideas that can help us think more Christianly about this topic or that and so it, it is an agenda setting function that Christian publishing does right yeah a book is a conversation um, it always with the author but often with all the people the author's been conversing with, whether as a scholar, um, whether as a ministry leader. Um, and you can follow that conversation in the pages of a book, you know, with an author you might never meet. Maybe that's because they're a big shot, you know, who, who's, you couldn't get past their entourage today. But it might just be because they lived 500 years ago and they're long gone. And wow, here now we can actually have a uh, have an opportunity in the pages of a book. So we, I know Alan, I love um, introducing authors and the kinds of um, thought provoking, challenging, um, and also encouraging conversation that can, that can only happen at the, at a book length <laughs> conversation where you're, 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 uh, you're expanding your mind. As, as Al said, you're, you don't necessarily come out from every book knowing the right answer, but you're, we, we always hope you're asking the right questions and, and uh, challenged to go on and ask even more questions from, from an IVP book. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, as the, as social media has changed things, as the temperature rises more quickly than maybe it has in the past, I'm curious from your perspective, how people are engaging content differently, you know, like have, have there been ways that you've tried to adapt to reach people that are more in this like modern social media type audience versus people who maybe had the attention span to sit down with, you know, a tome. <laughs> um, and, and how has that worked on your end as far as which books you publish, how you publish? We do sometimes say that our, our competition isn't necessarily Erdman's Baker Zondervan and all the rest. Our, our our competition is every tweet, every post, every TikTok that shows up in somebody's newsfeed. That's that's a uh, that's giving them uh, helping them focus their eyeballs elsewhere. But we have noticed that we do engage our readers through any number of different ways. Now it's not just the book. It's sort of book plus, whether it's blogs or webinars or or uh, podcasts or uh, whatever the next medium might be. We are. Uh, we do engage people at various levels wherever the authors happen to be in social media and and our our ebooks are also simultaneous with our print books so our our ebook sales are about 15 percent of our total so the majority of our of our sales are still print but but it's simultaneous ebook and print these days yeah and and that's pretty typical industry-wide you know 15 years ago the there were a lot of prophecies of the death of the paper book and that just simply has not turned out to be the case. The you know ebook sales rose rapidly, but have plateaued now for over over a long haul. And personally, that doesn't surprise me. That there are some kinds of books that you would rather have loaded up on your device and be able to uh, get at any time. So, for instance, I'm a huge Logos user on mobile devices because I have the whole thing. You know, when I never know, you know, when a question like what is that Hebrew text, you know, that I just heard in that sermon? Um, well, hey, it turns out I've got the whole library in my pocket because of the because of the mobile device. There's some kinds of reading, some kind of reference that's really um, great for that. But we also know that there are plenty of readers um, or kinds of books 
that you want to sit and hold in your hand, maybe even, you know, a premier kind of edition with, you know, pretty paper and a ribbon and, you know, that kind of thing. So we, um, I don't know, I think, I think it's fair to say we've got a hybrid view of um, the kinds of uh, resources that IVP needs to publish in order to um, satisfy those felt needs for different kinds of readings and different life situations. And one way that the books themselves have changed is that many of the ideas are front loaded. Uh, it used to be you'd have, sorry, let's explore the topic and here's all the problems and here's all the issues and here's the history. Um, and readers these days you know, may not have the patience to work to the end to get to your conclusion. So we encourage our authors uh, offer, offer problems and solutions throughout. Uh, so it's not just, you know, at the end of the book, you get solutions or applications, that, but every chapter along the way, you're saying, what, what's the takeaway? What's what's going on here? I see a question here in the chat about, uh, do we have books on PTSD, anxiety, depression? Uh, we just released one called the Anxiety Field Guide, and this one is in 30 short chapters, 30 or 40 th short chapters, almost devotional length, that you can read on different topics uh, relating to anxiety. It, back in the old days, or traditionally, we might have had a 12 chapter book, uh, 200 page book with 12 chapters with each one 20 pages long or something like that. But but part of the context, uh, having it in these short chapters, 30 or shorty or 40 short pieces, that that is a way of helping engage our readers with content more quickly and, and practically. Yeah, in fact, let me the other dimension of that question that's been asked is uh, the second half is about hymnody. And it, it's I'm struck by what a specific question this is. Are there ways to bring anxiety and hymnody together? And oddly, we have contracted a book um, that's coming out. It's, I can't tell you the title because it's still, um, I don't, the manuscript hasn't come in yet. But yeah, we, we, we happen oddly to have a specific book that'll be out probably in the next uh, two to three years on um, the impact of worship, including uh, worship music um, and what what worship leaders may be able to do to bless people who are uh, struggling with uh, anxiety, either diagnosed or not. So yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, that's one that sounds completely fascinating. And yeah. in another separate life, that like the topic of worship is one that's fascinating to me. And so bringing those two together sounds very fascinating. So I'm excited to see that book come out, John. Yeah. Um, Al, what were you going to say? I cut you off. I was just going to mention that one way we've seen books change over the decades is um, that the reading audience has changed. So a book like uh, James Sire's The Universe Next Door on cataloging worldviews, when it first came out in the 70s, that was a, a general trade book. It was for the sort of the center of the Christian audience, the, the thoughtful Christian reader, and it, it was sold in regular mom and pop Christian trade bookstores. Um, over the years, it has become an academic book. It's become used in courses and in, in colleges and seminaries, and, and it now is a textbook. Um, and it used to be that Jim Sire, when he was editor of IVP back in the 60s and 70s, he could publish books on existentialism and Kierkegaard and, and Hans Ruckmacher, and those would sell in a general Christian bookstore. Uh, that day is gone. <laughs> uh, now now those would be seen as academic books. So in some ways, we're, we're still publishing the range of, of books, but, but the, the audience has shifted in various ways. Yeah. yeah. Another another way to answer your question is that we actually also publish on uh, digital technologies, on attention span, whether from a psychological point of view or a cultural point of view. Um, so again, Al and I could could uh, start listing lots of books. He's edited a couple on um, digital versus analog church uh, life. Um, I had the great pleasure of working with an author named Felicia Song on a book called Restless Devices, which is from a sociological point of view, how the attention economy, um, if you will, works to, um, to, to pull people away from a, a, uh, a more thoughtful and in fact, Christian meditative point of view. So we, that's our other, that's another, <laughs> that's another weapon we pull out as uh, we can, when we're frustrated by TikTok or whatever, we can publish a book about TikTok. <laughs> and then we hope somebody reads it, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's continu continuing the conversation, right? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Read this book, not TikTok. Um, that's just me being a curmudgeon about TikTok. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> book talk is great, though. We love it when book talk sells lots of books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I've heard about book talk. Um, yeah, so, I mean, with that kind of 
uh, there's also been this rise of um, people following authors and kind of tracking with their work. How do you think about, you know, which authors you're publishing and how um, people kind of rally around personalities more than around ideas? So, you know, you had the four views books back in the day and now like somebody might buy that, but for one of the authors and, you know, already come to it with their opinion. How do you think about um, that kind of like, maybe not celebrity culture, that might be an overstatement, but that more leader centric, person centric sort of world that we're currently in? Well, when we sign up authors, we do look for authors who have some sort of following, some sort of uh, visibility and credibility that people look to them for whatever it is that they're the expert on. Um, it, it is very difficult these days to just publish a book on the merits of, of the argument, on the merits of the topic. Um, it is often it, the combination of the topic and the author, what they bring to the table, who they are, what the, their expertise is on it and how they are known. And that could include social media. It's not only social media, but it, it could also be any number of other things, conferences, networks, um, all, all the other things. We, we're looking for people that have something to say and who people are looking to, uh, to say something. Right, yeah, it's, it, there are other publishers, mostly beyond the Christian publishing sphere, where really a big name is just a ticket to a book contract. In fact, that person doesn't even need to write the book. You know, they're going to get a ghostwriter. Um, and, you know, it's a retired politician or, you know, Kardashian. A YouTube, yeah, a YouTube star or a TV star or whatever. And that's, a, you know, that's its own thing. Some people want to read those books. I, I think it's probably not too surprising um, that there's much less of that in the Christian sphere and hardly any of it with us. We, we don't mind celebrities, <laughs> but um, mostly the most important thing is do they have something to say? So, the, the kind of person who's famous just for being famous is like, honestly, that's just not very interesting, right? You don't want to read a book by somebody like that, probably. Um, but then, of course, there are big names whom we've published that uh, uh, have a lot to say. And again, we're privileged to be able to introduce a, a person like that. You know, a, a scholar like N.T. Wright, for instance, is published with us. And if you've ever been lucky enough to be at a conference where you got to meet him, you know he's a really nice guy. He'll he'll stop and talk to you. But wow, to be able to sit for 300 pages and have a conversation um, with N.T. Wright, that, that's the kind of thing that can only happen in a book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. It, it's interesting to think about who, who, you know, gets published these days, but also part of it, um, and this is going back to something I think, uh, John, you mentioned, of um, like you just have to publish different kinds of books, like or maybe it was out. I don't remember. One of you were talking about what was published as just a trade book, you know, 20, 30 years ago is now an academic book. Mm -hmm. And some of that, it feels like it kind of ties together with the decline in biblical literacy that we've seen. Um, people just seem to be in the word less. Maybe that's just a reflection of what was already there and we just see it more. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm curious, has that decline in biblical literacy hit the publishing world, the, specifically the Christian publishing world? Um, and is there anything that you guys are thinking through about how do we how do we change that trend? How do we try to encourage biblical, biblical literacy to grow? Yeah, Al is literally an expert on transformational <laughs> reading. So, I mean, he's I'm interested to hear him say some of this and then i'll say something as a historian well I, i'm thinking about um hmm. it, it is true that the entry point starting point for where people are at is is different than it was 30 40 50 years ago uh we are in a post christendom society post yeah you know, post evangelical there's a lot to be said about the, the loss of um uh, literacy and biblical literacy in particular, but it also is an opportunity in that when people are more unchurched, when people are more post-Christian, the good news is actually news. It's actually new to them. And, and InterVarsity has had some really amazing track records in the last few years of, of uh, new conversions, evangelism, uh, people coming to Christ, coming to uh, Christianity and scripture, fresh because they've never heard it before and so when they are exposed to it it, it is 
good news for for people looking for it. And so I think that encourages us to say, yeah, uh, there, on the one hand, there's nothing new under the sun. On the other hand, for such a time as this, and we will always need new books. We will always need new Bible study resources and and uh, commentaries and study guides and everything else under the sun to help people engage with with uh, scripture and the truths of the Christian faith in, in new ways. Yeah, part of what's behind our calling as publishers is to make sure that those resources are there for this generation, that when there's a new convert, um, whether that's on campus or, you know, in the neighborhood or through some other ministry, um, that they have that they don't have to wonder, oh, I wish there was some way, you know, who will explain what this scripture means to us? You know, we want there to be somebody right there. Um, and of course, the local church disciples, uh, you know, who can literally be in the riding alongside them um, talking about scripture, but also, again, books are, are sort of that virtual um, companion. Um, and we just want to make sure that those remain fresh and accessible and speaking to the issues of, of this day so that, uh, so that any new disciple or any, any, um, you know, advanced, uh, you know, wise and sagacious, uh, elder of the church, um, has, has, um, good meat to sink their teeth into, to grow. One example is that, um, often it is not scripture is not always the front door um often it is the, something else you know anxiety a topic uh some some felt need is the front door but then we bring in scripture and christian resources and here's the tradition of the church that that we bring to bear on the topic and so we're often meeting readers where they're at um uh, and there's a point of identification, but then there is dislocation with scripture and and the christian tradition to say here's where you're at, but don't stop there. Let's take you further and let's, let's uh, realize the good news on the other side of it. Yeah. Yep. Praise God for that work. <laughs> he knows we need it. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. So as we start wrapping up today, I kind of would love to hear from you both um, specifically on the topic of what, what looks to be next. You know, none of us are fortune tellers. None of us know the future, but um, you guys have both worked in the industry long enough to kind of have maybe a feel for what could be coming. And so um, as IVP tends to be on the leading edge of stuff that's happening in the evangelical world, um, and as trends arise, is there anything that you see coming up? Um, or where do you see publishing going, particularly um, with growing recognition of contributions from the global church? or people who would never necessarily be American personalities, maybe because they don't live here and maybe would never set foot here. Um, how would you think about that? And then the flip side to that question, what advice would you have for anyone who maybe is encouraged by this conversation to write or to consider the publishing industry as a career? Well, on, on the future of evangelicalism per se. I think there is a decentering of American evangelicalism uh, and a recognition of broader global voices and the, the global church that predates the American church and will continue on beyond <laughs> after the American church and and realizing we are part of a, a larger story. So I think to to recover and learn from voices from a variety of cultures and ethnicities and locations is is certainly one of the things that will continue to help the church grow um, beyond this immediate moment. Uh, there, there's a lot being said about, about the future of evangelicalism, decline of evangelicalism, but I think it is more than that that, um, that recalibrates us beyond it. Yeah, I, I, I would agree the, the bigger picture is almost always the the answer about the future. Um, the other, my wisecrack would be, if we knew what the future of publishing is, we would never tell this <laughs> openly. <on. laughs> We'd keep that secret to ourselves and figure out how to take advantage of it. Um, but of course, we don't know the future. Publishing um, has always been an extremely difficult business as a business because if you could pick the best sellers, then every publisher would just do that, and you know, th it would it would not be the uh, it would not be the the challenging uh, uh, business that it is, whether that's book publishing or periodicals. Uh, they've always been um, mission-driven, uh, really important um, 
businesses, but they're not like selling cars or soda pop or something like that. Um, but the bigger picture is almost always the right answer, um, as I said, and particularly um, jumping gaps um, in either networks of knowledge or or so networks of social capital um, to groups that may not have um, uh, interacted much, but each of whom brings something important to the life of the church and the life of Christianity. Uh, if we can figure out how... Um, to jump those synapses, if you will, then all of a sudden there's all kinds of new ideas there. Often those take the form of books. Um, those can be academic fields. Um, often much of the most interesting thing happens when an anthropologist starts learning about missiology or an economist starts on, uh, thinking about um, uh, the scriptural tradition or a geneticist, you know, starts reading uh the Old Testament. Um, all kinds of things happen when you when you get the sparks jumping places where there were gaps. Yeah, one example of that is our book, uh, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. Uh, and it's by biblical scholars who also have a background in missions. And so it's the intersection of hermeneutics with uh, missiology and anthropology and saying, what are the th dynamics going on in honor shame cultures or communal cultures that we don't see here in the West. So that kind of mashup, that kind of interdisciplinary work is very generative. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really does seem like there's so much, you know, just across the spectrum, it doesn't even necessarily have to be within, you know, the Christian sphere, like not necessarily a, a pastor, not necessarily a biblical scholar, but like having these broad range of like interdisciplinary, you know, ideas um, kind of, the Lutheran idea of like, if you are X, Y, Z, be the best X, Y, Z you can be, and then bring that to bear on your Christian life. And things come out of that. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Um, right. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, yeah. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Don't forget to pick up a copy of the book, Heart, Soul, Mind and Strength, um, which Al has edited. Um, there should be a link in the chat here in just a moment. Um, it releases on August 2nd, but you can also get the pre-order right now. So that will be up for you. Um, make sure that you're following us online so that you can catch us on our next live conversations. So whether you're on YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, make sure you follow us. Um, we're actually going to have details coming soon about interviews with Beth Moore and Dr. Michael Bird. So you'll want to stick around for those. Um, and so, yeah, make sure that you're sharing, make sure you're following. And Al and John, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Awesome. Our pleasure. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in online. We'll see you.